a column of life, Meg and her sons will wait until the late afternoon to go up, for this is often when there is a flurry of activity in the canopy as the macaws and toucans fly home to their roosts after foraging and the spider monkeys show off with aerial leaps as the day cools. So first the boys show Meg the jade green pool in the shadows of limestone cave carved out by the creek. They swim in and out of its shadows, resting on mossy rocks. Just outside of the cave, over the surface of the water, effets drop, in, drop their aerial roots from 100 feet, 30 meters overhead. The banks of the creek here grow thick with moss and strange ferns. The immense buttressed tree roots are covered with thin veils of bright orange lichen. After swimming, James stands in a slender arrow of sunlight. An owl butterfly lands on his head. He holds very still for almost a minute. He wonders if the butterfly thinks his bright blonde hair is a weird flower. The boys help their mom ferry equipment in the old leaky canoe to the other side of the creek, where she will set up the gear for a column study. Biological diversity means the various and different living things that are found within a community. Although Meg's work is focused on the canopy and the creatures and processes of life that occur within it, she must be able to make a comparison with something else in order to have a true picture of how this part of the machine works. Therefore, on the other side of the river, she has marked off several five meter, 16 foot squares on the forest floor to show that they are situated directly under some of the key observation platforms on the walkway. In Meg's mind, the square is like a column that stretches straight up to the canopy. It is her aim to try to convey, or to try to inventory or count the different species of plants and insects, insects starting from the ground up. There have been many methods devised for doing just this. The boys begin by helping another one of Meg's graduate student assistants dig pitfall traps within the square. With spoons and small garden trowels, they dig holes seven or eight inches, 18 to 20 centimeters deep. Into each hole, they sink a plastic cup with one inch of alcohol in the bottom of it. By the morning, they should have a fair sampling of insects that creep across this portion, portion of the forest floor and drop into the cup. With another graduate student, Meg counts the trees. She begins at the bottom of the column with the biggest trees. There are two tall trees, the tops of which reach the canopy. Inside the region known as the understory, which reaches approximately 30 feet, 10 meters in height, there are four different species of trees, a gryas, a palm, an acadia, and one she does not know the name of, but will look it up when she returns to Selby Gardens. These understory trees might someday emerge into the canopy or they might be crowded out by one of the young saplings of the next layer down. There are 41 saplings, four or five feet in height, struggling towards the filtered light. Among these 41 are five different species. Then just inches above the ground, Meg and her assistant count 197 seedlings. They too have begun their struggle toward the light at the top of the canopy. Continuing to count, Meg finds 10 ferns of three different species and 41 lycopods or mosses, of which there are five different species. There are also three kinds of lichen, and on the, on the gryas, there are 37 effets. By the time Meg and her assistants finish the inventory, they will have counted some 350 plants and 200 different plant species within this five meter square. In a temperate forest such as such an area might hold a total of 50 plants and at most 30 different species. Meg needs to sample the kind of insect life that is just above the ground in the shrubbery. To do this, she gets out a beading tray, a shallow screen tray that measures one square meter, nine square feet. While the boys and her graduate assistant hold the tray, she shakes what she estimates to, estimates to be a cubic meter of foliage for 10 seconds. They set down the tray and see what fell out from the shrubbery. One leafhopper, Megan says, pointing to an insect frantically hopping about on the screen. There's the one with the really weird jaws, James says, as he squints clo closely at the tray. In this first shake of the foliage, there is also ants, cockroaches, springtails, spiders, and a caterpillar.
They do this two more times with different foliage, all at the same level within a five meter square. Next, the boys help their mother to do a set of sweeps. Sweeping is another technique for sampling insects in the column. The sweeps, however, take the pitfall traps or the beating tray, are aimed more at flying insects. Using a butterfly net, Meg aims at a cubic meter of air three or four free feet up from the ground. She sweeps the net to the right and then to the left. She does this four times and then sets the net down in her catch. There is one leafhopper, three diptera flies, and three beetles. She sweeps the beating trays, the pitfall traps, and the counting of seedlings, saplings, and trees are all ways for Meg to take snapshots of diverse rainforest life. Finally, when it seems everything in the five meter square has been accounted for, it is time for the boys to go to the top of the column to the canopy. When they climb expertly into their harness, with their mom in the lead and their uncle Ed behind, they begin their ascent. The boys are not in the least bit nervous, although Meg is. She has left behind all of her note-taking equipment so she can concentrate on the boys' safety. They know not to fool around, argue, or whine. They must think and climb and pay attention. James and Edward are very excited. For now, at last, they are going to the place where their mother has gone five, five days a month, every month of the year, for as long as they can remember. It is a special world. They think of the high secret place as their mother's world, but they know it is only where she works. It is the canopy and it belongs to rainforests all over the world on the planet Earth. But still, they like to think of it as their mom's own special place. And finally, they have grown big enough to be let in. Oh man, exclaims James. He is 87 feet, 27 meters high. His feet are so small he can rest both of them easily on a staple. He has come nose to nose with a bark beetle glittering like an armored knight. It looks like something out of his science fiction comic books. Weird, weird, totally awesome. What is it, James? Meg calls down. A beetle, it's beautiful. It's kind of purple, no, sort of gold. It's black like polished metal and it's got this weird Darth Vader head on it. Maybe it's poisonous. Oh gee, I hope not, don't touch it, keep on climbing. At last, they reach the walkway. Meg finds a pen she left behind and has them help her number a few leaves. Then they climb onto platform three. With their uncle's help, they inch out towards the bromelade. Don't touch the tarantula, Meg calls after them. They see, a climb, they see it climb on its jointed legs out of the bromelade. Any frogs in there, Meg asks? Nope, James replies, but I think I see a salamander. Edward wishes for the small jeweled venomous snake his mom told him about. There's even a snake that can flatten itself and sail between the avenues of trees. His mom saw this once when she was working in Cameroon, West Africa. In Cameroon, there were no walkways or staples for footholds. Instead, there were immense inflatable raft that a draggable floated over the rainforest canopy and settled upon the emergent crown of trees. The raft, like a huge mesh trampoline the size of a baseball diamond, stretched across a wheel-shaped frame of rubber platoons. Meg stretched the raft with a rope. Once there, she always wore a safety harness as she hung over the side or walked the platoon streets. The raft made it possible for Meg to sample leaves on the emergent layer of the canopy, a level on which she had never worked before. She also made numerous measurements of a leaf's qualities, such as, such as its toughness and its water content. Meg found that leaf-eating insects consumed significantly less foliage in the upper crowns of the trees among the sun leaves when compared to the shadow leaves in the middle of the crowns or within the canopy itself. As fun as this giant trampoline in the sky was, working from it was also grueling. The sun slammed down upon the scientists like a sledgehammer. Temperatures climbed to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 49 degrees Celsius every day. The extreme heat was not the worst thing though. In Meg's mind, underneath the platform was, of the tent was where she slept at night lurked one of West Africa's deadliest snakes, the Gabon Viper. It had not been, it did not ease her mind to be told that the snake was very shy. Once in the middle of the night, as she made her way through the out, to the outhouse, she snacked into a battalion of army ants. 
She screamed bloody murder and woke the entire camp. Everyone was sure the Gab Gabin Viper had struck. But the army ants with their fierce jaws can deliver a stinging bite that is very painful. In Panama, at another site, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, there was no raft or walkway. In order to study the hitchhiker vines that serve as highways for leaf-eating insects, Meg had to swing through the canopy on a huge construction crane. Standing in a gondola and keeping in radio contact with the crane operator so that she could steer her where she wanted to go, Meg was able to go through the study of vines that linked the canopy trees. In one place, she found a single vine could lace together 64 different canopy trees. That night, after supper of more bananas and of more beans and rice, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and a surprise of Oreo cookies brought all the way from Sarasota, James and Edward take a walk with their mom along a forest trail. The moon, although full, only appears in pieces, a tiny bit at a time, as if the diamond chips were scattered through the leaves of the canopy. It is dark and so humid, it feels as if you could hold the air in your hands. Thousands of insects flood the air and the ground. Safer at night, they come out to feed, flit, and fly. Streams of leaf cutter ants might still be visible in a chip of moonlight on the underside of a leaf. Another armored beetle, beetle, burnished bright as gold, goes silently about its work. Look at this, Edward speaks softly. Gleaming in one low br brush is a beautiful spider web. It moved, whispered James. The breeze, says Meg. No, Mom, look. Everything, something very odd is happening to the web. It is not the wind that is moving it. Through some mysterious power, the web is being drawn back into a funnel shape. It's the spider, Mom, James exclaimed. Indeed, the spider is winching in its own web by pulling on a line. Then, almost, almost as if there is an inaudible ping, the web springs back and the trembling center is in the trembling center is a small insect. They must call that a slingshot spider, Edward exclaims. The boys are thrilled. Meg is astounded. Never before had she seen or heard of such a spider. They wait for another 10 minutes. Two, three, four more times the spider takes aim with its cunning web, web and traps another insect. Meg gets out one of the insect files filled with alcohol she always carries. With her tweezers, she deftly plucks the spider from its web and puts it into the vial. Mom, the boys both cry, you killed it. But we have to take it back. I'm going to send it to the Smithsonian for identification. But what if it's the last spider, the very last slingshot spider on earth and now it's dead in a bottle, James protests. Meg has an answer for her sons. She points to an identical web and its inhabitant nearby. She has been a scientist working in the field for so long that her first instinct is always to balance the collection of good data with conservation of an unknown species. It is natural curiosity that makes her a scientist, but it is responsible collecting for identification that makes her a good scientist. What is permissible or justifiable is always a concern. Do the ends justify the means? John Arbin, the famous naturalist and bird painter, has always been considered a great artist, but today is regarded as an irresponsible environmentalist. He shot thousands of birds, not for identification, not for scientific research, or for even better understanding of the bird's habitats, but simply so that he could paint the most beautiful picture possible of that bird. A flamingo, an egret, a tern, a pelican, whatever. He might shoot 50 birds of one species in order to create his illusion of nature. Of nature. The boys are quiet as they walk back through the forest. Now it is time for bed. While they brush their teeth, Meg traces a leaf and maps the area eaten by insects on graph paper. When they are all ready, Meg arranges the mosquito netting and then gets out a book for their bedtime stories. It is one about pirates. James and Edward love pirates. One-eyed ones, one-legged ones, and of course, those who steal and bury treasure. Chapter 29, The Black Spot Again. Their mother's voice always sounds the same when she reads the chapter number and title. When it changes, it becomes her real storytelling voice. She begins, the council of buccaneers had lasted some time when one of them re-entered the house. She reads on, 
There's a breeze coming, Jim, said Silver. Soon the boys forget their spider and their mother's vial of alcohol. They are thinking about Long John Silver. Is he good or is he really, really bad? Don't trust him, Jim, they think. He could kill you. Both James and Edward think a lot about walking on the plank. They often wonder if they could survive, undo the knots. Their, moms keep, their mom keeps reading. The boys' eyelids grow very heavy. The drone of mosquitoes does not bother them. Edward remembers the velvety tarantula high in the canopy. He wishes they could have seen the venomous snake that looked like the jeweled necklace, but he did see the Darth Vader beetle James found. They all get mixed up with Long John Silver. Their mother's voice grows dimmer. I saw Silver now engaged upon, keeping the mutineers together with one hand and grasping with another after every means possible and impossible to make his peace and save his miserable life. Meg's voice spins out into the night. The words dissolve into a thick, humid air of the rainforest. They become meaningless sounds in the darkness. The palm viper coiled into the buttress roots of the Acadia tree might hear them, but more meaningful is the flick of an anole's tail in a nearby philodendron leaf. An ocelot on the prowl has passed the empty web of slingshot spider and moves towards the strange sounds. A chameleon clamps his toes on the side of a stem, three on the other, and listens to the soft burr of noise from inside, the place it cannot see. In the understory, above the chameleon, a frog slaps its sticky padded feet on a palm frond and freezes, and these are the sounds of the enemy, the koati. And far overhead in the canopy, a fruit bat cocks its sonar towards the dark little cabin 100 feet below as it sweeps through the night dropping a seed here, a seed there. The words, the strange sounds melt into the night as a tiny bromelade begins to grow in the silence and invisibly high above. The bat flies on. The boys are sound asleep. Meg walks into her porch and down the steps onto the ground. The rain has begun again, so as it so often begins, with the single separate drops sounding more like thuds than tiny plinks of city rain. It is a round sound, so round and so liquid that it is easy to imagine the shape of each raindrop as it splashes and flattens on a broad leaf in the top of the canopy. Within these first few seconds, she can actually hear the rain high up before she can feel it but those drops continue, finding their way down through the layers. The clouds let loose bellyfuls of moisture. One rain sphere slides into another until the water falls in thin strands. Within minutes, it is beating down so hard that the thin silvery strands lose their shape, turning into liquid smoke that clouds the air. Meg goes back to her porch and lights her Coleman lamp. She gets out her computer in the dim, foggy night of the rainforest. A small neon green light rectangle is illuminated. She needs to enter the latest figures on the leaf eating patterns that she has mapped on the graph paper, as well as yesterday's insect inventories. She is alone. Meg spends much of her time alone in the canopy, but then back on the forest floor, pondering what she has seen above. But despite the solitariness of, his, of her work, the lonely hum of the computer and the clinking of the keys. In the back of her mind is the consoling knowledge of other scientists and pioneers. It is easy for her to bridge the chasm of more than 100 years and reach out towards the one who navigated a path to freedom by freeing all of the moss on the north, feeling all of the moss on the north side of the trees. Where Harriet Tubman's experience is so different from her own, didn't they both have to trust their knowledge of the earth and find their way through the tangled darkness? It has been a very long day, an anxious one with kids up the canopy, but the very thought of Harriet Tubman, Tubman is strangely reassuring. So Meg types on through the next several hours until her computer batteries begin to fade and the gray of a new dawn filters slowly through the canopy. In just another few hours, it'll be time for her to climb into her safety harness and navigate her way up, one, up once more through the understory and into the canopy for another day of work, the last frontier of the rainforest.